Soup. So we're a global network bridging tech solutions and services for good. You might know TechSoup for a software program, but we're much more than that. We also provide support, training, community, and much more to help over 1 million nonprofits in more than 200 countries and ter territories, and we love to be your resource partner. And to help make that possible are the more than 100 plus corporate donors and providers of software, hardware, and services who have chosen TechSoup to create and grow impactful and kind donation programs. So what that looks like is our tech marketplace is where you can see all these great offerings from our partners. So please check it out. We're going to include that link, um, but that's where you're going to find solutions that you need to help your nonprofit uh, run and to serve your mission more efficiently. So any you can see this list from Adobe products, Google, Microsoft, Zoom, and so much more. So that link link has just been included in our chat by Stephen. All right, so before we get to today's content, there's one last thing. I want to share this special resource page at TechSoup.org for nonprofits impacted by COVID-19. So as I've mentioned, TechSoup is committed to equipping your nonprofit with the tech resources that you need to meet your mission. So that's why we've compiled these resources, which include things from tools to support remote work, webinars like this one, related blog posts, free courses, and much more. We're always updating this page with the latest resources, so it's a really good one to bookmark, and it's a great one to share with your community. And thank you, Stephen. He's just included the link for this page in the audience chat. Okay, and once again, we've got some questions if um, this – presentation will be shared, and yes, you will get a copy of this presentation and the recording and any links that we mention in an email 24 to 48 hours after this webcast. All right, on to today's introduction. So once again, I'm Nicole at TechSoup, and we're joined by Stephen Davidson, who is assisting our chat. And on today's webinar, we're also joined by Nobility's Director of Education, Jessica Looney, and Accessibility Advocate, Jillian Fortin. Welcome. We're so happy to have you here, and we'll let you take it away. Nicole, thank you so much for having us today, and thank you, TechSoup, for all of the work you do for all the nonprofits all over the world, and I'm so happy that Nobility can be one of the resources to provide today. Uh, and as she mentioned, I'm Jessica Looney. I'm the Director of Education for Nobility. We're going to talk a little bit about our program that's called the Accessibility Internet Rally today, and also everything you need to know about web accessibility and why you should advocate for it, which is really the reason we're here. So as I move through, I'll just start with, we already got introduced, so I'm joined by former staff member and current volunteer, Jillian Fortin, who is an accessibility advocate, has worked for Nobility, and has an exceptional knowledge in accessibility, and I'm super grateful that she's here today joining us. And she'll be speaking to you a little bit more and getting more into the weeds about some of the accessibility features we're gonna talk about in the beginning. So she can talk a little bit more once we get to a little bit down further in the slides. But I guess I'm going to start with what my superpower is because I thought, you know, that's a good way to start. So I believe that my superpower, at least these days, is humility. I'm going to go with that one. And with that, I will move on. So accessibility. So let's talk a little bit about this. When, when we talk about accessibility, we, we think a lot of times in terms of standards or adherence to standards. But it's really important to remember that accessibility is really about inclusive design, and it's for, like, real people with real human needs so that people with disabilities can acquire all the same information, participate in the same activities, and produce and manage content. So you'll hear me say inclusive design several times throughout this presentation because it's really what it's about. It's including everyone. So why advocate for it? Why advocate for inclusive design? We start with, we've got this legal up here, technical, humanitarian, visionary, all of these are super important. But when I think about working with nonprofit organizations, I think mostly about market. 
I believe most of us are humanitarians or maybe visionaries in the sense that we care and we have passion for a cause. And there is the technical aspect, but I think it's important to remember, and the legal aspect, of course, it is, it is the law, but it's important to recall your market and think about your market and who those people are. And we'll talk more about that a little bit later, too. And also thinking about what it means in terms of the number of people that have disabilities and how your market relates in that particular sense. And I'll get into that a little bit more as well. So you don't have to take my word for it or our word for it because we have people that we know who are coming from different perspectives. And so I have included several videos here with links and hoping that they will work when I click on them. I'm not sure who can actually get to that or if they can get to that. This might be, I'm not seeming to be able to get to it, but let me talk a little bit about we'll these. We'll include it in the audience chat. Okay. Yep, we'll include those links. Great. Okay. So just speaking about these videos are from the W3C perspectives, and it's a really wonderful place to go just to get a perspective on the different types of assistive technologies that are out there and different ways that people communicate through assistive technology. These are particular folks that we know here in Austin, Texas, which is where I'm from and Jillian's from, or at least she lives here now. And uh, so Desiree has been a long-term friend of ours, and she uses this text-to-speech feature. And I think it's a good, I mean, I think it's really good to go look at these videos because it gives you a really good sense of how she uses the technology and demos it for you in a very good way. It's not actually her, but that's the person we know who uses this technology. And it really changed her life when it became available because she was blind from birth and only knew how to use Braille uh, when she was very young, but there were no technologies that worked for her as a young person in school. So now that she has the text to speak feature, she's able to do a lot more in terms of you know, work. And now she has a wonderful job and she, she works from home and has been for many, many years. And she's got three kids and she's a full-time mom. So it's, it's pretty miraculous. Uh, Gene Rogers is another person and I can say his last name because he is actually of the Gene and Dave show, which if you have not ever seen it, you should go check it out. It's really fantastic. But Gene uses keyboard compatibility and actually uses what is similar to like a straw to, to talk with, to use, to tap on his keyboard because he has mobile impairments. So another video that you should go and, and check out is for keyboard compatibility. And again, these are not the actual people I'm speaking about, but, but the, the videos have different people and they're, they're very well portraying the different assistive technologies. And then Gibby is actually my son and he has to have understandable content. And this is one of the things that we're going to get into here in the weeds when Jillian's talking just about what that means and how important it is. But when the content that you are writing and code, like for a website in particular, it really needs to be something that can be understood by someone who has, say, an invisible disability, which is something we talk about more these days because he, he in particular has, you know, his attention span is, is slow. And so he needs, he needs things that are really easy to understand and that aren't going to make it challenging for him to learn. But we'll talk more about that in a little while. So please check out the videos when you have an opportunity because they're really fantastic. And these are just a few of the features we're going to talk about today. Okay. So Accessible design. So we're talking, as we're talking about this, you know, it, it translates into like improved performance in many other areas. So that includes things like mobile browsing devices and improving search engine ratings and improved search engine ratings. Inclusive practice supports the diversity of your customer base, but it also promotes a company's accommodation to hire and train staff with disabilities that's required by the ADA. When you're talking about universal design, it's accessible design. Again, we're back to supporting all people. And good design is accessible design, is the quote of Dr. John Slayton, who is who we named our Access U annual conference after. So that's a wonderful quote, and it's so important. Again, I told you I was going to say universal design a bunch of times, so I already have. 
So examples of something like this. So people with disabilities using assistive technologies or adaptive strategies is another way to talk about it. And videos that have caption text, which we all know about. You know, we've all seen caption text at this point. Some of you are seeing it right now. So people with hearing impairments can still get the message of what you're trying to communicate. Now, for me personally, I really enjoy having the captioning feature on anyway. It, it helps me, especially when I have to, I sometimes I'll just hit the mute button and I'll just see the captions, which is really pretty great for me. So it's something that I use in my daily life, which I think is an interesting way to think about it, because again, we're talking about inclusivity. So links. You know, having descriptive text is another important feature. So instead of saying something like click here, which is a very common uh, mistake in terms of accessibility, to say click here, you would say, here is a list of all anti-inflammatory foods, or here is a list of our staff. So that's just a, an example. And again, that's, we're going to get into this a little bit more. So in, in the HTML code and for a web page, so all of the graphics and the photos also need to have alt tags. So that allows someone with a sight impairment to hear via their screen reader, the descriptions of what graphics and photos are on an actual page. That's what that will do for them. And then all of text that is within a graphic is represented as text somewhere on the page. So this this all of these are, again, features We'll get into more in a, in a minute, but sort of an overview of how assistive technology, such as screen readers, magnification devices, and keyboard shortcuts can, can work properly. So one in four adult Americans have a disability. And I mentioned earlier how, as a nonprofit, I think it's really important to know this, this fact because it's nearly one billion people worldwide. So if you're a nonprofit, you have clients, you have funders, you have staff, you have volunteers, donors, and unless you're contributing accessibility or building accessibility and inclusive design into your, your web and into your website, then you're not actually reaching your 100% of your customers or your clients or your volunteers or donors. And just thinking about it in terms of also having temporary disabilities, which is something I've been thinking about a lot recently because I sprained my ankle, sets me back, you know, I, I'm not able to do certain things that I'm used to being able to do. Uh, you know, having a son that has a slight disability also is a challenge. And so it makes me think about it from different perspectives. Elders, a lot of our clients are, are elders and, you know, Again, my father, elder, he has disabilities just from simply aging. So I think thinking about it from that perspective and just understanding that it's not just people with disabilities, meaning, you know, say a mobile impairment for life or blind, you know, it, it can mean a lot of different things. And so when we're thinking about it, we should think of it as an inclusive, inclusivity and diversity. So that is sort of the, and then of course the legal obligation, which I, I tend to stray from a little bit as a nonprofit just because I feel like that is, yes, we are legally obligated, but I think it's more important to address the humanitarian and the market and, and all of those other things we talked about before. So with that, I'm going to let Jillian kind of go through what we've just kind of, the overview we've done so she can talk more about exactly what these features are and how they work. And I think it'll be really useful. So I'm turning awesome. it over to you, Jillian. Great. Thank you so much, Jessica. And thank you so much for, um, for creating a really solid foundation for the rest of the presentation. Um, I know a lot of these concepts can be overwhelming when you're looking at them in um, a bulleted list or whenever you're reading and thinking about all the things that you need to do. Um, but our job and our goal is to help introduce you to some really quick wins that you may or may already be, uh, uh, you may or may not already be doing, but that you can quickly do to get you a good portion of the way there. So before I dive in, um, just if you wouldn't mind navigating to the audience chat and just sending me a quick yes, 
if you are involved in updating your organization's website, creating documents, managing, managing social media channels, just hit me up with a quick yes or a hit. Um, okay, awesome. Thanks, Rebecca. Courtney, Christy, great. Um, awesome. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, we've got a lot of digital content managers on the line. So um, that is super helpful. So I know a little bit more about how to navigate the, um, the conversation. So a few common barriers that I'm going to be introducing to you in the next section. Um, go, uh, you know, taking a look at the bulleted list here. We've got your, your website page structure. You've, we've got the reading order of the content on your site, um, some keyboard focus items that you may not be aware of if you use a mouse, some text alternatives. We're going to talk a little bit about color contrast as well link text and multimedia. So that's images and videos. And I do see a really great question in our Q&A regarding alt text like Jessica mentioned. So I'll be, I'll be sure to touch on that here um, during our conversation. So the first thing is page structure. So if you and your organization is using a content management system like uh, WordPress or Squarespace or Wix or, um, you know, maybe you have a custom website template that lives on your own hosting. Um, you may know that when you go to edit, edit a page, there are different little chunks or areas. So they all pretty much follow the same um, sort of anatomy, which we've, which we've uh, pasted on the right. A lot of times it starts off with your header area, um, then a navigation area that displays a list of pages on the site as well as how they relate to one another. And then you have uh, your main body content, which typically um, it, it's in that uh, light blue color. And your your page content, your body content will follow, you know, We'll, we'll have like a text header, some sections, and then a footer. Um, and then on the right, you'll see that pink area um, that will sometimes house uh, snippets or announcements or sometimes even ads. If you use your website to help monetize and bring some revenue into your organization. But there is, there is um, a method that you want to follow whenever you're organizing all of the different content on your site. So if you'll take notice at the headers within the blue areas, um, you want to follow a, a, a nice clean semantic structure um, by putting the right types of headings within your content. So semantic means not a visual presentation. Um, so Sometimes what we want to do is we want to use header types just because they look pretty or they we want big font instead of little font. Um, you want to work with your web developer to identify, um, you know, the, the right types of headings to use. Usually your headings will be called like a header one or a header two. And what that does is it allows folks to use um, screen reader technologies to be able to call up these different types of, um, oh, is my phone low? Okay. Um, to use up these different uh, header menus so that they can browse through all of the different um, headers and, and, and areas within the site without having the screen reader read the entire page to get to the part that they want. So it, it helps them um, it helps them get around your site with with a lot more ease. So the reading order for assistive technology has to follow the order displayed for site users. So if I am a newspaper that has a digital copy on a website, I want to make sure that all of the names of the titles use the same uh, all of the articles use the same header as. Uh, for the for their titles, um, 
you want to make sure that um, a logical tab order through links, form controls, and interactive elements are, are uniform across all of your pages. Um, and this part provides page titles that are meaningful to orient users among a set of pages. That seems a little bit obvious, but sometimes a lot of folks will try to stuff a ton of keywords into their page titles for the sake of SEO. And I want to make a, a comment about keyword stuffing and, and, and how accessibility is actually a better use of your time than keyword stuffing. Um, essentially what you're doing whenever you're creating an accessible website is you're creating a, a website that an assistive technology or a machine can use a lot easier. Well, what is a search engine but a different type of machine, right, that looks for patterns and looks for, um, looks for different types of content within a site so that it can index you properly. So when you create an accessible website that is friendly to AT, you, you also create an accessible website um, that can be used by uh, a search engine. And then last but not least, skip links. Um, you know, I, those can be super helpful, not just for your AT, but for your or AT meaning assistive technology, but also for your users in general, especially if you're going to have content heavy website. Um, it, it's really uh, important to help your web users not have to make too many clicks to get to the content they need. So, um, Links, a list of links is also a menu that an assistive technology user can pull up. So um, if you can imagine when they get to a site, they can decide, give me a, li a list of all the links on a site or give me a list of all of the headers on a site. That way they can just jump to all of the different sections on your site. Um, all right, so another thing you want to make sure is that your website um, can be used by keyword keyboard only users. So um, I, I encourage you after this presentation to go to your favorite website um, and then after you type in the URL, step away from your mouse or your trackpad and start seeing whether or not you can tab through. And when I say tab through, um, can, you hit, can you hit the tab button and navigate around the site to get to the section that you want or need. And, and, and you know, make it that simple, but um, see whether or not you're able to get through the main navigation area and, and if it's obvious when you're doing that, um, where you are within that journey. It's really important because there's a good amount of our population who, who cannot use a mouse. Um, and there are also a lot of uh, power users who prefer to use a mouse because for them it's it's a lot easier. So um, I, it's a really neat example. Um, so I would definitely encourage you to to try that. All right. So um, one of my favorite topics: <laughs> basis of text alternatives or alt text for images. Um, so if the image is on your site in a way that it is meant to convey a meaning. You want to provide alt text. So a great question that was, an, uh, that was asked earlier, do all images need alt text? Um, the answer is no. If they are purely decorative, um, then they can, they can be empty. So in that second bullet, you'll see an empty alt attribute, which is alt equals, um, for decorative images, it, it's sufficient. And you can also decide not to put your images in your HTML content. You can code it in using CSS or a cascading style sheet. And a CSS file is basically um, a file on your site that can, uh, communicates to your web browser how to make things look. So. Um, a, a lot of times AT will just ignore CSS. Um, and so you'll also want to provide alt text for, uh, 
you know, sometimes we we will run into linked images. Um, you want to make sure that alt text is provided to let the user know that they're about to be taken to a different destination. That's really important. Um, and last but not least, you would like, uh, you, you want to make sure that uh, images that can be kind of hard to understand, like charts or graphs or, um, you know, COVID-19 models are um, are fully described as much as possible. Because especially when it comes to these types of things, they're meant to convey an idea, a message, um, something really important. And so you, you want to make sure that that doesn't get lost just because the assistive technology cannot discern what that information is. Okay, um, I will try to keep my mic in one place. Just let me know if, uh, if it's getting too hard to understand. Okay, all right, so color and contrast. So you want to make sure that you are using color uh, to avoid using color as the only method to, de to denote a state or requirement. And we see it a lot when it comes to uh, forms especially. So, um, Color blindness is something that a, a, a big chunk, I don't remember the percentage, but a big chunk of our population um, live with every single day. And so in this example, we see that in this form, um, a required field is, is denoted by uh, just red, the color red. Well, you want to stay away from that because there are some people who cannot see the color red. So what you want to do instead is provide either an asterisk or the actual text that says that it is required. Um, so if you're going to use a color, make sure that there is another uh, way that that folks can actually uh, discern that information. Um, and as a, a general rule of thumb, you want to provide contrast of text against a background of 4.5 to 1 or higher. Um, about, I would say maybe almost 10 years ago now, it became super, super popular for web designers to create web designs with white backgrounds and then really, really faint gray or really, really faint blue text that was teeny, teeny, tiny. Um, and yeah, it looked cool in the name of, min uh, of minimalism, but it was really, really hard to see. And, um, and, and you, a lot of times, um, the first person in your organization you want to get on your side when it comes to inclusive design is your web designer. It is very possible to have a cool, sleek design that is also accessible. So um, there are tools available that will help you measure the 4.5 to 1 color contrast. Um, the uh, If you Google color, uh, color with a U in it, contrast analyzer with an S, um, there is a dropper tool that allows you to just, um, you know, pull it up and check your foreground to your background color. It is really neat. I use it all the time. Um, okay, moving on. Link text. So you want to specify link text, um, you know, it, it, instead of just saying click here or uh, read more. Um, here, here's something you, you might want to check out as, as an experiment also. Um, the next time you get an email newsletter from your favorite website or mailing list. You want to uh, notice, take notice of how many times the phrase read more or read here or learn more, click here are used. Well, if I'm a, if I'm a uh, blind user and I'm using uh, a screen reader software and I pull up a list of links, and I hear, click here, click here, read more, read more. That doesn't actually tell me where I'm supposed to be going, so I have to guess. Um, so you want to be able to, uh, you want to be able to make your, your links a little more obvious. Um, so instead of saying, 
read more or click here, you could say something like uh, read uh, read more about the Cuban Missile Crisis or learn more about Nobility's programs. Um, so uh, that's – and it takes some practice, too, because sometimes they can be really, really long. Um, so you – I, instead of it being hard, I like to think of it as a unique design challenge. Okay, so um, a next quick win you can take a look at is how accessible are your media files? So um, you want to, if you're using video with your organization, you first want to make sure that your media player is keyboard operable. And in the last, um, in, in the last uh, few years, a lot of our popular media players like YouTube and um, YouTube and Vimeo are uh, they, they've really made major strides in making their their players uh, keyboard operable, um, especially Vimeo. Um, they and I, and I do want to just um, say that they've they've worked with us to help make their media player keyboard operable and more accessible. So um, we know that to be very true whenever I say that. Um, and then you want to make sure that you caption all of the audio content on your video and make sure to synchronize to on-screen actions if you are going to use those types of functionalities. So if you are um, active in your YouTube channels and you have your audio click out to different landing pages on your site. Um, are those are, are those properly notated within the YouTube Studio Editor? Um, does the action reflect the text that you use? So uh, just double checking to make sure that that is something that is uh, properly configured. Um, and then you last but not least want to describe meaningful video content in an audio description track or in a text transcript. And this is a part that a lot of folks can stumble with because um, sometimes, especially whenever you're watching a movie or you're watching a video, there's a lot that is being communicated by the actions of what uh, th that's happening on screen that isn't actually being spoken. So what type of nonverbal action is being is being done? Is Does it warrant an audio track? Um, or, or an audio description, and can it be included in a text or in script? Um, captions and, and these types of things, a lot of this media support is usually something that a lot of people think would be a nice to have, but they just don't have the budget for it or they don't have the turnaround time. And I'm, you know, I, I know that Jessica will support me in saying, actually, these are. Um, uh, these are a lot easier than, than you think. So out of the box, completely for free, if you upload something to YouTube, then captions will be auto-generated for you. And you can go back in and you can make edits. And um, and that is a really free way, or that, that is a free, um, save from the amount of time you spend, way to get your media more accessible. Okay. All right. Um, and then... So let's, you know, let's imagine that you went through these different steps and you were like, okay, well, how, how well, how well did I do? Am I doing okay? Am I on the right track? So um, here is a really great tool that we encourage you to use. It is a, a tool designed by the uh, W3C, which is the World Wide Web Consortium. Uh, you can check out their site at w3c.org. And um, this Easy Tech page um, provides you a first review of your assets or your website's web accessibility. So um, it's a really great place where you can, you know, see how much work you need to do and how, how far these quick wins took you. Another way for you to see where you are and, and get a temperature check on, on uh, your progress is to ask people with disabilities if they can use your site or if they can check out your media. 
Um, you can reach out locally to uh, your your local um, disability organizations. Many many major cities have their own chapter of the National Federation of the Blind. Um, there are a lot of Reddit forums. Like if you are a Reddit user like me, uh, you want to check out the the subreddit for accessibility. There are tons of different places and watering holes where you can go to ask for help. And um, we at Nobility, we offer this as a community program as well. Um, if you or your organization is interested in having a user test done by by a panel of people with disabilities, we would be more than happy to get that set up for you. Um, and last but not least, an opportunity to see where you are uh, in meeting your accessibility goals um, and, and get some help is through participation in the Accessibility Internet Rally. And um, I will now turn the mic back over to Jessica to uh, tell us a little more about what AIR is and how to get involved. Thanks, Jillian. I get so excited when I'm hearing all of this information, and it reminds me it's, it's like a it's an overview of our conference. It's like you're not getting into the, you know, digging really deep in, but you're getting a good solid overview of what accessibility really means and what you can do with this right now, which I think is really important. So Jillian mentioned AIR. I mentioned it in the beginning. And the Accessibility Internet Rally is how Nobility got started. Actually, uh, it started as a one day hackathon with in Austin and our executive director, Sharon Rush, uh, was the one to start it. And so I've often called it the signature program, even though now I don't know that that's exactly fair. It's just one of the greatest programs, I think, in, in terms of learning about accessibility and, you know, what you can do with it and how you can continue your education in this in regards to accessibility. So how does their work? So we have teams that we build with developers, like teams of web developers and designers that sign up to compete in this competition, which is what it is. It is a competition. And the idea was that to, for it to be like a fun way to learn about accessibility without it seeming like you're working so hard and it's just a fun way to learn. So the idea is that we team up designers and developers with nonprofit organizations, artists, any kind of non-commercial products to receive an accessible website. And the training is specific to whatever role the developer designer has in their company organization. And we match the teams with the nonprofits based on the interests. We, you know, you complete a form, we find out who you'll work best with, and then we match you with those people. It's about six weeks of dedicated work time. So not meaning six weeks in terms of like every day all the time, but it is about a six week long commitment. And you do have to designate someone to oversee and, you know, be the person to communicate with the teams to make sure that the sites are coming along as you would like. And they're committed, they're, they end up being submitted for judging. We've created a judging form. We have an expert of judging advisors who have created an accessibility form that scores it on, you know, uh, I believe that the top score is about a 300. And then at the end, we have, we have these fun, wonderful websites and we have these fun events that are happening during the, during the uh, actual production of AIR. And as Sharon Rush would say, it really is a production and it's a lot of fun. So we assign you a team of web pros to work on your website. And then we, and I encourage nonprofits because I think it's, it's super important as someone who came from a nonprofit background and walked into Nobility one day and started to learn about accessibility and, you know, understanding like from the get-go what it really means and then attending the training themselves because there is training available on Moodle, which I won't really get into right now, but the training itself is super valuable. So I always encourage the nonprofits to be as involved in that training process as possible so that then when you are complete, like when the project's complete at the end of the six weeks, that you can then continue to update your website to keep it accessible, not just to have it be accessible at the very beginning. So we assign you a team 
And what the projects receive from this is they get the training with the client and the team project management feature. There's mentoring from our staff. I typically oversee it, but we have a lot of tech team members that are super involved in the process. And you have that dedicated team of web professionals for six weeks, and there's usually four to six people on the team. And then you get the full website redesign or design. If you don't have a website, we design it. If you have one, we can redesign it. And then there's the optional hosting for a year, which is about $25 after the first year. But it's free for the first year. And then you can move your site to a new host if you'd like. That's completely fine as well. And we've included the link to the Air Rally site here. Uh, I believe it's also it's on the last slide. I'm not quite sure, but this is the link to the Air Rally's information because we have opened registration, which is the next slide, which is our timeline. And our timeline, we've just opened registration recently. So we'll be doing a lot of training and a lot of recruiting until September 10th. And we'll have a live NPR training on September 10th to talk to you more about about AIR and about what to expect, what the expectations are on your end and on the development team's end. And then the development training will happen most of September, you can see. And then the kickoff event, which is super fun. And that's when, and I'm gonna just go ahead and move on here because that's when you get to actually meet your team. You get matched with your team. You meet them. Now, whether it's remote or in person is fine. We do typically have here in Austin, we'll have a in-person uh, kickoff, but we always have the remote component, typically on Zoom, and you'll get to meet your team, talk to them about your goals, and again, we have a lot of forms that help kind of help you realize what those goals are for your site, and then you'll distribute your contact information and figure out the best way to communicate. Then on November 12th, we have our final countdown event, which last year, Jillian hosted, and it was super fun. It was at a, a local business called Galvanize here, well, the local version of Galvanize here in Austin and at their building. And it was so much fun where you get, this is when all of the sites get turned in, the teams and the public come together and you attend to celebrate with the teams because they finished. And then the sites get pushed live onto the server. And that's when the judges get the copy and they start their assessment. But this is just the chance for them to say, you know, we did it, we're done, we finished, and the nonprofits were there this year to support them. They were grateful. It was super fun. And then finally, the end is in January. So we give the judges a good amount of time to actually do the judging because it takes a little time. It's, it's not a simple task. It takes them a little time to go through each and every single uh that on the on the judging form, as Jillian mentioned, I mean this this is just like I said an overview of all of the different types of you know things you can learn from uh, air and accessibility in general. But on the 21st, we have the awards, and the sites have been judged, and awards are given in three different categories, and it's just a really fun opportunity. It's the same idea we have it in Austin at a, an event center of some sort. I'm not going to say exactly. I think I know where it's going to be, but I'm not going to say because I'm not sure it's still to be determined. But we do Zoom as well, and we have live video recording, and, and we everybody gets to talk to each other, and all the teams and the MPOs are represented at this event. So it's a big, fun, exciting time, and this year it went so well. So that kind of goes through the timelines. Now, I mentioned we, we do have to manage our expectations from the nonprofit perspective just because there are some things we can't provide and because the teams are, they're volunteering their time to, to do this for the nonprofit. So at the end of the competition, that's why I highly encourage the training on the part of nonprofits and really working with the mentors on the staff so that you understand how to maintain the site once you're done. So, because the teams themselves are not necessarily going to be available after the competition and the management at the site, that's just something that you're going to have to take on yourself and empower yourself to do it. That's what I say, because I think that, again, the training component is so valuable and we are updating it again for this year. And I, I just think that it's something that everyone should know how to do. And I'll go back to that inclusive design, you know, think about your market. 
think about who you're serving and, and what you can do to help them and to get the word out even more. So with that, I will mention uh, airrallies.org. And, and now I guess we have to open it up for questions because we've gone over. <laughs> so thank you. Yeah. I've been trying to uh, to answer some via chat so that we get through all of them. Um, this is Jillian, by the way. Nicole, how do we want to handle this? I've, I've, uh, I think I've done three questions, but they were great questions. I can, uh, I can go over them so everyone can learn. What do you think? Yeah, I think that would be great. And just first of all, thank you so much, Jillian and Jessica. This was such practical information that nonprofits can take back to their organizations. So, so first, just to thank you for your thoroughness. And yes, Jillian, I think that would be fantastic if you can cover the questions that you did answer. We'll start there. Okay. We've got some other questions. Awesome. I will try to limit it to like uh, maybe one minute per question. And Jessica, if you have any input, just let me know. Sure. Um, okay. So the ones that I did earlier, they were really great. Um, the question was, um, what, you know, how do drop down menus impact usability, particularly for users who don't use a mouse or a touchpad, which is a fantastic question. I think drop down menus can be really great. Um, my own preference as a user is to include them because I want to be able to see what pages lie beneath. Um, they can be used with no problem if done correctly. And if you, I, I don't know if you can see the answered tab, but I've included a list, um, or a, a tutorial on how to do fly out or drop down menus. And a great example for you to check out is actually Target's website. Um, if you try to tab through just with your keyboard and open a drop down menu with an enter button and then go through the, the whole menu, you will see a hidden, um, a, a hidden item at the very end called close that only opens up if you're tabbing through. So you can, you can call upon that that hidden element that has been coded in for your convenience so you can have um, a richer user experience. Um, so hopefully that helps. Um, another question was, what about labels inside of form fields? So you want to make sure that each form input only has one label. Like whenever you're coding out a form, um, there is like a, a different, a, a certain uh, code snippet called label, um, and that the label, the actual text label inside the, the form um, meets color contrast requirements. And, um, you know, we recommend a font size of, of 14 or higher. Um, and I included a link to a tutorial on a, on a community website called webaim.org as well. Um, so hopefully that is helpful. Another question that I see um, is, let's see. Oh, to so follow up the drop down menu question since we're on this topic. Um, so it's the same sort of rule as creating um, navigation. You want to stay like under nine items if at all possible. Now granted, when it comes to uh, design theory, there are other websites it, 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 depending on the type of website, you you know, like if you're on Amazon or if you're on New York Times, those uh, those requirements don't always apply to you because your user understands that they're going to be met with a plethora of menu items. So um, it's a good rule of thumb, just in general, based on design theory, you want to stick between three and nine, but there are obviously always um, examples for you to not not uh, adhere to those rules. Um, what are the best platforms for engaging closed caption? I can give you our um, preferences. We we use rev.com um, because we are a nonprofit and we are also Austin based and they have an office here. Um, but also if you're if if you have a smaller budget, um, we we use the YouTube trick all the time where we let the auto-generated captions kick in and we just go in and edit it. A lot of times it's easier to edit it than try to transcribe it yourself. Um, but if you do want to take your hand at, try your hand at trans transcribing, YouTube also has a transcription tool. Um, and there's also another tool called Amara, A-M-A-R-A.org, that um, you can 
ask the community to help crowdsource your captions. So, um, oh, and that was that's time. Oh, I am out of breath, Nicole. But um, <laughs> if you guys, if you guys have any questions, um, email email Jessica or I at any time. Um, you can you can get the both of us at air at nobility dot org. I am Jillian at nobility dot org, and Jessica is Jaylooney at nobility dot org. Great. And I just included that in the audience chat, and we'll make sure it's also in the post-event email that's going out to everyone. Everyone's going to get slides, a recording links that were mentioned throughout the presentation, and then the contact information. So I'm sorry about the audio issues that we had at the beginning, and I know it sounds like we had some during the webinar. So thanks for thanks for bearing with us. Um, and yes, these other questions that I do see here, we'll we'll share it with the Nobility team and see if we can't respond one-on-one. Um, -on -one. There's just a few few here. So we really appreciate you all being with us. And I just want to wrap on a couple notes here. So before we go, I'd like to invite you to take a survey to help Texu better understand how we can support some of the challenges that nonprofits are facing right now. The survey should take about 15 to 20 minutes, and your feedback really makes a difference. So we're going to go ahead and drop that survey link in the comments section, and we're also going to include it in your post-event email. And then we also have some other events coming up, so stay tuned. You can check out our full lineup and our past events at techsoup.org slash community hyphen events. And it looks like our audio has disconnected again, so hang with us if you can still hear this. We're wrapping right now. We also have a post-event um, survey going out that helps us with this with this webinar so if you can please take the post event survey and apologies again for all of the audio issues but yes a shout out to our captioner at texas closed captioning thank you and once again thank you so much to jillian and jessica for your engagement your thoroughness and just your commitment to accessibility uh, for nonprofits and just the community at large so thanks for being with us Thank you, if you're still there. Thanks for having us. There you are. Yes, yes, I'm here. Thank you for having us. We appreciate it. Absolutely. All right. And to everyone, thanks again for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you at a future virtual TechSoup event. Until then, take care. Stay safe. Bye-bye.